flash for nature photography? You bet. I use it all the time. And today I'm going to walk you through some of the basic functions of a typical hot shoe flash as they relate to nature photography. But first off, what is up with all the chili pepper madness? Stick around, I'll clue you in, and we'll take a little tour around a hot shoe flash. Hey, I'm Greg Basco. I'm here in my home studio in Costa Rica with my favorite flash, the Godox V862. This is just like the flagship flashes from the big name camera makers. It does everything they do and a little bit more for a very affordable price. I have a little sponsorship with Godox, but that came about only after I had used and grown to love Godox products for a couple of years. So unbiased, but I really recommend this guy. I'm going to go through a lot of the functions and all the parts and pieces of this flash, and it's going to be relevant to you no matter what kind of flash you use, because all these flashes have similar functions. Now what's up with the peppers? In future weeks and months, I'm going to be doing some videos using my peppers. I love these guys. I grow them in my garden. I love to eat them, and they have lots of different shapes and colors and forms. So I'm going to use these peppers for some studio videos related to hard versus soft light, flash modifiers, TTL flash, manual flash using more than one flash for a setup, uh, and that'll be a great use of some studio time, since like most of you, it being 2020, I can't get out much these days. So let's take a little spin around this flash. The first thing we notice on this flash is the battery compartment. It has a built-in lithium-ion battery pack, which is pretty cool. It keeps the charge for quite a long time, and recharges pretty quickly when you're using it out in the field. I think it's great. I don't have to worry about carrying around more AA batteries, AAA batteries, things like that, that we would normally have to have. Uh, it has some ports on the side here that I'll show you. We have the wireless control port in the middle, and that's kind of a legacy thing, as I understand it, to work with different old transmitters and receivers and things like that. We have a sync port, which is a really old school way of wiring flashes together so that they can communicate. And then we have a USB port, which is found on most modern flashes these days, and that allows us to do things like update the firmware. In the front, we have an AF assist panel that helps us to acquire focus in low light by working with our lens and camera. We have some little blinking lights that will go on when the flash is in receiver mode so that it can be used off camera. We have the flash head itself, and it has, like most flashes, a little built-in diffuser panel, and also this white thing, which is a catch light panel. Now, the diffuser part alone um, ensures that the flash gives a wider area of coverage. We'll talk about that later. And this little panel is for bouncing things off the ceiling and it will produce a catch light in your subject's eyes. Not something we use for nature photography a lot since we don't have ceilings to bounce off of out in, out in the, the, the natural world. But there it is. And of course, lots of different buttons and functions on the back that we're going to go over in just a few minutes. So I'm going to break the functions of this flash down into five categories. And the categories are mode, sync, zoom, wireless, and custom functions. Let's get into it. The first mode we encounter on the back panel, the LCD panel of our flash, is called TTL. It might show up as ETTL in Canon, ITTL in Nikon, maybe Sony, Olympus, other ones have their own little uh, appendage on there to the name. But it, they all work the same way. TTL stands for through the lens. And what that means is that when we take a picture, the flash actually puts out a little pre-flash. I'm going to demonstrate that in just a second. That pre-flash bounces off the subject, comes back through the lens, and is read by some special sensors within the camera chamber itself. They take into consideration things like the autofocus distance from our lens, our f-stop, and our ISO, so that when the picture is actually being taken, the flash puts out the proper amount of light for a correct exposure. So let's, uh, let me show you, this is pretty cool, let me show you how the pre-flash works. I have my camera, uh, my camera set for a one second exposure and I have it set in mirror lockup. So that when I press the button the first time, the mirror is going to lock up and as soon as that happens, you'll see my flash fire out a little pre-flash. That's what's going to bounce back off the subject, come back in and help the camera and flash to work together to determine the proper flash output when the picture's actually being taken. So here we go, TTL mode, mirror lock up, there's the pre-flash. I'm gonna take the picture now, and there's our flash. And that's how TTL flash works. 
Now, you might ask yourself, well, that's cool, Greg. Uh, there's lots of fancy calculations going on between our flash and the camera, and that can be really great. But have we given up control over the flash exposure? No, not at all. We can control it via a function called flash exposure compensation, which works exactly like natural light or ambient light exposure compensation if we were shooting in aperture priority mode, shutter priority mode, or even program mode, in the sense that it's based off the readings from a middle tone subject. So just like we're outside, uh, if we're shooting something that's basically tan or, or a medium tone, we could use zero ambient exposure compensation. If we're photographing a polar bear out in the snow, we might want to add plus one or plus two stops to brighten our exposure in accord with our subject. If we're photographing a black bear on an asphalt driveway, we're probably going to take our exposure compensation down, minus one, minus two. Flash works exactly the same way. If I were filling the frame with a dark subject using flash as the only light, I would set my flash exposure compensation a little darker. If I were filling the frame with a white orchid, I would set my flash exposure compensation up. So check it out. Here's how we set it. The default is usually zero flash exposure compensation. And that means, just like in outside ambient light, that means that we can properly expose a middle tone subject in the dead of night with no other light source except for our, for our flash. If we want our flash to put out one more stop of light, that is our picture to be twice as bright in terms of the flash exposure, we simply dial in plus one flash exposure compensation. If we start again at zero and we want our flash to put out half as much light or to be twice as dark, we dial in minus one flash exposure compensation. And if we want even less flash, we can keep dialing it down minus two all the way to minus three. TTL is great because it allows us to obtain proper flash exposure uh, given our flash exposure compensation that we've dialed in, no matter if we're moving around, our subject is moving around, and if we're changing our camera settings. In nature, we're often photographing subjects that are moving around, so our flash to subject distance is not going to stay the same. And a lot of times we might say to ourselves, wow, I want to stop down my aperture for more depth of field. Maybe I don't want my ISO this high, and we're going to change things. TTL flash allows us to keep up with all of that. So it's a great versatile setting for using flash in nature photography for all kinds of scenarios, whether it's wildlife, macro, or even landscapes. The second flash mode we encounter is manual flash mode. And in manual flash mode, there is virtually no communication between the flash and the camera, except for the camera telling the flash to fire at the proper instant. We can see the difference even in the hot shoe connectors of a flash that has TTL and manual capabilities versus a flash such as this Godox TT600 that is a manual power only flash. And that can be useful for, for certain situations. But we can see that easily just by looking at the connections on the bottom. The manual flash will have one pin, which is simply the firing pin, whereas a TTL capable flash will have multiple pins, usually four more, that will allow for some of those more complex calculations that we mentioned earlier. So, we set our flash output in manual flash mode via flash power settings. One to one is full power, that is the maximum output of which our flash is capable. And then from there, we can dial in full stop or even third stop increments as we go all the way down from full power to one half, one fourth, one eighth, each of those being one stop less powerful or putting out only one half as much light as the previous higher power output. And we can go all the way down to 1 1 28th, usually for most of these hot shoe type flashes, some flashes even go lower. In manual flash mode, because there is really no communication between the camera and the flash, our flash is always going to put out the same amount of light, no matter if I'm 10 feet away from my subject or a mile away from my subject. That can lead to inconsistent exposures and it can make things tricky out in the field. So why would we want to use manual flash instead of TTL? One reason is precision. Again, since the flash will always fire the same output, it will never be influenced by any meter readings or other things going on in conjunction with the camera, our flash output is consistent. And that can be really helpful for certain situations. But there's actually a more important second reason, and that is because the intensity or the output of the flash is really not dependent on the light being brighter or less bright. It's dependent in its majority on the duration of the flash pop. So let's take a look. I have my flash here set in manual mode at full power. Let me look away. That's pretty strong. I'm going to set it down to 1 1 28th power. The flash is almost imperceptible at that power. And if you take a look at this table I'm going to put up right here, you can see that higher flash powers 
are related to longer flash durations, and lower flash powers have much shorter durations. That's really useful to us in nature photography because if we're trying to freeze action, let's say for hummingbirds, for bats, even for snakes, anything that moves, we will try to pick a shorter flash duration, meaning a lower flash power. The third flash mode we're offered appears as multi, and that refers to stroboscopic flash mode. That's a mode where the flash pops like crazy discotheque lights. Uh, we've seen it maybe if you've, if you've ever seen a picture of maybe a baseball player swinging a bat in a dark room during a long exposure, and with multiple flash pops, you can see that bat appear at different portions of the frame as the flash goes off. And it's a pretty cool mode. It's not something we use very often for nature photography, if at all, but I have some crazy ideas I'll be sharing with you in some months to come. But let's go through it anyway, because it's something that a lot of people don't know about and don't understand how it works. And that's because the menu can actually be a little tricky. And when you check it out on your flash, you'll see that there's even a setting for Hertz. Why Hertz? Well, Hertz is a concept uh, that was, that was uh, come up with by the German physicist Heinrich Hertz. And Hertz refers to the number of cycles or the frequency of a cycle of a given phenomenon that occurs in one second. So how many times something happens in a period of one second? Now, what does that mean for our camera? Here's how it works. As we go into our multi-flash settings on our flash, we're offered three options. Now, first of all, this only works in manual mode. It doesn't work in TTL, which makes some sense. I'm gonna dial in a low flash power, short duration flash, thinking that maybe I wanna stop some action and that would be cool. Now, my next choice is how many times do I want the flash to fire during my exposure? I'm gonna pick 10. Our next option is then the Hertz. How many Hertz do we want? Uh, I'm gonna put five Hertz. And what that means is that the flash will fire five times in one second. Now, we can easily figure out what the minimum shutter speed we need to make this happen is by dividing the number of flashes we want by the hertz. So I want the flashes to go off 10 times total. I have five hertz, they're going to go off five times per second. 10 divided by five is two. So I will set my camera in two second shutter speed and that will give enough time for all of those 10 flash pops to accrue. So let's try it out. Again, I have my camera set for two seconds, my flash, 132nd mode in multi mode, 10 flash pops, 5 hertz, and here's what happens. That's 10 flash pops. Pretty cool, huh? That's multi or stroboscopic flash. Let's move on to sync modes. Our hot shoe flash of this type has three basic sync modes. As we set this on the back of the, the panel, you'll see that the first setting doesn't appear as anything. That means we're in first curtain sync when the flash fires at the beginning of the exposure, which is what we do normally for nature photography. The next uh, setting we'll, we'll encounter, at least on my flash, is a little H with a lightning bolt that refers to high speed sync flash, which I'll get back to in just a second. And then the last little icon that pops up is a series of little arrows that refer to second curtain flash. That's when the flash fires at the end of the exposure. Let's do a little demo. I have my flash set here in manual power and it works in TTL also, but I'm just going to keep it simple and we'll go with, with manual power. I have my flash set in first curtain sync. I have a two second exposure on my camera. So when I press the button, the flash fired at the beginning and now the exposure is done. I'm going to set my flash now in second curtain and we can see what happens. I'm starting the exposure right now, but the flash isn't going until the end. And that's the difference between first curtain sync and second curtain sync. Now, why would we want to use second curtain sync? Uh, it's usually if we're going to try to use a slow shutter speed for some, let's say a bird flying across our frame, some, some subject in motion, if we wanna capture some of that motion blur, but also freeze a portion of the image with flash. Um, the reason we want second curtain flash is because it just makes more sense to our eye and to our brain if the motion blur is behind a, a sharply defined subject. Um, let's say, just by example, if my hand were moving across the frame and I did first curtain flash, you would see my hand sharp right here and then motion blur in front of it. And imagine that's a bird flying, you'd have a sharp bird here and then a blurry bird in front. Whereas if we use second curtain flash, we'd have motion blur building up throughout the exposure and then right at the end, a flash pop to sharpen up the bird and then we'd have that sharp bird flying with the motion behind it. It just looks much more natural and pleasing to us. 
Now, what about high-speed sync mode? I can't demonstrate that because it works in a way that the human eye just cannot perceive. But basically, high-speed sync flash refers to a way, a pulsing stroboscopic type of mode that's different from the multi-flash uh, stroboscopic mode I described before. But it works this way so that we can use our flash with higher than normal shutter speeds. Higher than normal shutter speeds means faster than the sync speed 1 200th or 1 250th for most cameras. Why would we want to use that? Let's say I'm out shooting a bird uh, in my front yard and the light is very, very strong, which happens here in the tropics, of course, very quickly. After about 8 o'clock, I have a lot of light so I could get fast shutter speeds, but the light is going to be very harsh, it's going to be contrasty, and I'm going to have some shadows. What if I wanted to add some flash into the picture to tame those shadows? High-speed sync mode will allow me to use flash to deal with the shadows while still keeping a really fast shutter speed to capture the action that I want. I'll go over high-speed sync much more in a later separate video, but for now, always have your flash set in high-speed sync mode. It will operate that way when you have fast shutter speeds, and when you have normal shutter speeds, it will operate normally. And that way you'll be ready to capture action no matter the kind of light you have to deal with. The next suite of settings I call zoom, and they relate to some of the properties of our flash head itself. Uh, we can zoom our flash head in and out to change the angle of coverage or the angle of output of the flash. Think about a flashlight that you might have that has an adjustable beam spread. So if you turn the head one way, it might throw out a really wide area of light. If you turn it back the other way and dial it in, it'll be a really focused kind of spotlight. And our flash works in exactly the same way. Usually this is set automatically. There's some communication between our camera and our flash so that the camera reads the focal length of our lens and transmits that information to our flash. So if I have a 24 millimeter lens on my camera, my camera will uh, communicate to my flash and set the flash zoom at 24 millimeters so that the angle of output of the flash matches the angle of view of the lens. If I have a 105 millimeter macro lens, we'll probably see the zoom being set to 105. If I have a really long lens, a 500 millimeter, 600 millimeter telephoto or something like that, the flash cannot match that really, really narrow angle of view. The best it can do is about 200 millimeters. So that you'll see that if you're working with a super telephoto lens, uh, your flash will be set to 200 millimeters, and that's the best you can do. Later in a different video, I'll talk about some flash modifiers that focus the beam more for bird and wildlife photography. Uh, but for now, that's how it works. There might be some times when we want to override that automatic zoom setting. I do it a lot, actually. Um, and we can easily go ahead and set the flash ourselves, simply by going into the zoom settings and turning the dial manually. Why would we want to do that? I sometimes uh, use flash for macro photography. Not sometimes, I do it a lot, actually. And a lot of the time, even though I'm using, let's say, a 150 millimeter macro lens, which is my lens of choice, I'll set my flash to 24 millimeters. Why? Because I want the flash to be a broader beam of light and effectively sort of a larger light source to help soften the light just a little bit. I also like using flash for landscape photography, so if I had a wide-angle lens on, I might want my flash to be more of a spotlight, just to hit certain elements of the scene. So I might dial in the zoom of the flash head to, I don't know, 100 meters, 150 meters, 70 meters, even if I'm using a 20 millimeter lens. As we change our zoom setting manually, you can easily see that the internal elements of the flash head are actually moving around inside there, and that's what allows us to control the spread of our flash. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the flash head also has this little flash diffusion panel and the little catch light panel. Again, this white thing, not so important to us for nature photography, uh, but the flash diffuser panel is pretty nice because it spreads the light out even more, which is great if we're working with an extreme wide angle lens, let's say a 14 millimeter. In fact, you'll notice on the back panel of your flash that the zoom setting, when you have this flash diffuser panel pulled down, is always set to 14 millimeters for most flashes, for most systems. Now, you might find yourself in a situation where you're trying to override that um, and you're just trying to use your flash normally and you can't figure out why does my flash keep telling me that the zoom setting is at 14 millimeters. That happens a lot and it's because you might just not quite have the flash diffuser panel tucked all the way in and so it's still reading as if it were pulled out and it set the flash zoom automatically to 14 millimeters. So if you're ever in a jam like that and you can't get your flash zoom out of 14 millimeters, make sure this diffuser panel is pushed all the way in. That's a pro tip. 
I'm going to do an entire separate video on wireless flash functions. If you've ever been on a workshop with me, you know that I could talk about this for days, and I might not even shut up after a few days about it. There's a lot to talk about. But for now, let's just concentrate on the four main options um, that we're usually given with our flagship flashes and their wireless capabilities. As I go into my Godox flash, I'm presented with four options for wireless flash. The first one is a little up in the top left corner, a little squiggly kind of sideways flash that refers to infrared transmission. That's an old school way. Godox has included it here for backwards compatibility with older flashes, maybe some older transmitters and receivers. I don't like to use that one, um, so I'll go through it next. I'm presented with another option related to infrared. I don't use that either. But when I get to the third option, you see a little kind of radio antenna tower, and that's radio wireless flash. That's what we want to use these days. The first option I'm given is radio master. I prefer to say commander these days. And that allows our flash to control in wireless radio transmission fa fashion. It allows this flash to control another flash set off camera as a receiver. So when I go to the next option, I also have the little radio mode. And now here it says slave. I prefer receiver these days. So we have commanders and receivers. So now my flash is set in receiver mode, meaning that it can pick up a signal from another flash in the hot shoe or from a radio transmitter that I'll talk about in just a second and fire off camera, even if there's no line of sight and even if it's up to 100 meters away. That's pretty amazing. Every camera system, every flash system these days will have a radio transmitter option. And these are great. I love using these for off-camera wireless flash because it mounts right in the hot shoe of our camera and then we can use it to control one or more flashes. And so take a look at this little demo. I have my X-Pro-C transmitter from Godox and I'm going to use it to control my V862 flash, which has TTL. So I'm going to set it into group A and have it function in TTL. I'm also going to use a Godox TT600 flash, which I mentioned earlier only has manual flash capabilities. I'm going to set it to group B and set it in manual mode. So I can now control the output of those two flashes independently right from the hot shoe of my camera using my flash transmitter. And finally, the last category relates to the custom functions. Now, these are kind of obscurities. We don't really need to know about them. You could take a new flash out of the box, start using it without even looking at any of these custom functions, and you'd be just fine. But I think a lot of people don't know what they do, don't know what options they have. So let's do a quick run through the functions, custom functions that I have on my Godox flash. And again, they're going to be similar. Some of the naming conventions might be different, but they'll be similar to the type of advanced operations you have on your own hot shoe flash. Okay, I'm going to long press the zoom slash CFN button to get into the custom functions on my Godox V860 Pro. The first custom function I'm offered is meters or feet. I know metric, but I prefer feet for a little greater precision. APO is whether your flash uh, goes to sleep automatically after a certain amount of time. I put that to on to conserve battery power. Next, I have a couple of options related to flash exposure bracketing. I never use that for nature photography. We should be able to dial in our exposure when we want and not unnecessarily flash our subjects. Next, we have the AF assist on and whether the flash goes to sleep or how long it takes to go to sleep in receiver mode. I set that to 60 minutes. And then the most important function, beep. You do not want to be that guy or gal out there whose flash is beeping every time they take a picture. Um, so to respect your fellow photographers and your subjects, turn the beep off for sure. Light I have set to 12 seconds, and that means the light on the back LCD panel of the flash will stay on for, for 12 seconds. LCD, that option for me, simply adjusts the contrast of the light panel on the back LCD screen of my flash. That's up to you, of course. Um, Godox has an option called ID, which refers to assigning a specific wireless ID to your off-camera flashes when you're doing wireless flash. That's really only important if you're working like in press where there are a bunch of people using uh, wireless flash to avoid crosstalk. And then finally, the last option is for when I have a flash in receiver mode, whether those little blinking lights blink or do not blink. I prefer to keep them on. I don't think they affect the subjects at all and I like to just be able to see if I need to that my flash is ready to receive in receiver mode. And those are my custom functions. 
Thanks so much for joining me. You know, my new ebook, Flash for the Nature Photographer, has 350 pages of info related to flash and nature photography. Check it out in the link below if you're interested. Be sure to follow me on Instagram at Greg Basco Photography. Lots of cool photos, stories, little tips and tricks related to nature photography, and lots about flash too as well. And of course, if you've liked this video, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel right here and like the video. If 10,000 people like this video, I promise to eat every one of these hot peppers. It will be my next and last video. Adios.